kind of girls do you prefer? My wife. Your wife. What That's kind of girl is she? She's a nice girl. What kind of girl do you like? Uh, John's wife. John's wife. I told you not. Bunch of clowns. It's only like the small fellow. When John was 15 years old and still at Quarry Bank School, he met a girl called Beth, whom he became very fond of. But her parents wouldn't accept him being friends with their daughter. Before me, there was another girl he mentioned to me, named Beth, whom he was pretty serious about. But her parents couldn't stand John. He kept saying to me, Don't worry, they banned me from seeing her anyway. They think I'm a ruffian, they won't have me around. Years later, while John was dating Cynthia Powell, he was still wondering if he and Beth could have made a go of things. It bothered him so much that he skipped a meeting with Cynthia and went over to visit Beth. The outcome was that both sides decided it was definitely all over between them. So John returned to Cynthia and admitted to her why he hadn't turned up the night before. As a young teenager, Barbara Baker lived in Ridge Tor Road in Liverpool and spent her summer time riding her bike or playing tennis in Calderstone Park with friends. John Lennon's half-sister remembers her as his first fully-fledged fan, a strawberry blonde called Barbara. She was only a schoolgirl, but to Jockey and me she was like a film star, with lots of long blonde hair and glamour. Barbara first started taking notice of John one Sunday afternoon when she was walking home. From Sunday school with a friend, John and his friend Pete came charging down the lane and when John spotted Barbara's hair up in ponytail, he began to shout, Oh, there's a horse face, horse's tail and horse's face. This made Barbara think that John hadn't changed much since they were little, when he was the boy who would perch in the tree and shot arrows at her and other girls as they walked home from the school. He stopped teasing her and they had a short conversation as they walked along the road. Barbara was surprised to see that John was very smartly dressed in a white shirt, school tie and a blue blazer, and after he managed to speak in a civilized manner to her for a few minutes, she accepted his invitation to walk about a few nights later. Barbara and John Lennon were together over a year, her being his first real girlfriend and reportedly the first girl he slept with when he was 16 years old. When John rushed to tell his best friend Pete Shutton about this, it wasn't just his kiss and tell attitude that showed his lack of care and tact towards Barbara. Pete remembered his recall clearly, a report which was known too flattering towards Barbara, and soon proved that John's behavior towards her had been less than courteous at the time. A trend which continued throughout their physical relationship when a lack of privacy caused Barbara and John, along with his friend Pete and Pete's girlfriend, not only to share the same room, but also sometimes the same bed. Years later, John's recollections of his time with Barbara continued in the same trend. I remember a night, or should I say day, in my teens when I was fucking my girlfriend on a gravestone and my ass got covered in green fly. This was a good lesson in karma and or gardening. John left Barbara for a short while and started going out with a girl called Margaret Jones, but went back to Barbara before long and was still with her when his and Lance Gann formed a group called the Quarry Man, and began playing dances and events such as the St. Peter's Church Fate in 1957 where John Lennon and Paul McCartney first met. Thelma Pickers was born in 1941 in Liverpool, England and met future Beatle John Lennon when she became a student at Liverpool College of Art in 1957. He was sitting at a signing in table with another boy named Tony Carricker when mutual friend Helen Anderson introduces them. My eyes definitely set on John. Tony was prettier, more handsome, with dark hair and dark eyes, but John was so powerful. When he was in a group like that, the focus of attention went to him. He had a presence. I found him very striking from that point on. Neither Thelma nor John were in a hurry to go home and sat together on the steps of the Queen Victoria monument near the bus terminal, chatting. They friendship blossomed as they discovered they had quite a few traits and experiences in common. John quickly named her Thel, and by the February of 1958 the two had become a couple. Whenever John's Aunt Mimi was out playing bridge, 
John and Thelma would meet up in the brick-built shelter on the golf course, waiting till the coast was clear before heading inside the house to spend some quality time together. I went to his house soon after. It seemed really posh to me, brought up in a council house. We were alone, he showed me around and we had a bit of kiss and a cuddle in his bedroom. Paul and George came round and we all had beans on toast. Then they played their guitars in the kitchen. I had to leave early because Mimi wouldn't allow girls in the house. She was very strict. She wouldn't let him wear drain pipe trousers. So he used to put other trousers over the top and remove them after he left the house. In July of 1958, Alma temporarily left college, effectively ending her relationship with John by her absence while retaining their friendship. It just petered out. I certainly didn't end it. He didn't either. We still stayed part of the same crowd of students. She was startled but pleased when she heard that John had taken up with Cynthia. I thought she'd be good for him, temper his aggression. I knew she had to tailor herself into looking like Bridget Bardot for him, and I remember reflecting on the fact that he teased her so much about being so proper. I remember thinking, he's got what he wanted again. We were close until around Easter of the following year, 1959. At an art school dance he took me to a darkened classroom. We went thinking we'd have it to ourselves, but it was evident from the dean that we weren't alone. I wasn't going to have an intimate soiree with other people present. I refused to stay and he yanked me back and whacked me one. He had aggressive traits, mainly verbal, but never in a private had he ever been aggressive, quite the opposite. Once he'd hit me, that was it for me. I wouldn't speak to him. That one violent incident put paid to any closeness we had. I took care to not bump into him for a while. I didn't miss drinking at the Yee Cracker with him, but I missed the closeness we had. Still, we were friendly enough by the end of the next term, because he did not work. He was on the brink of failure, so I loaned him some of my work, which I never got back. A few years later, Thelma briefly dated one of John's bandmates, Paul McCartney, who had just played up with his long-term girlfriend Dot Rome. He used to come into the art college canteen with George Harrison. Paul was quite young then, and George even more so. They were both overshadowed by John's personality. By the time they were dating, Paul had developed from the plump young schoolboy into someone very much his own person. Renato was a German girl who lived near where the Beatles played in Hamburg. In the early 60s, when they were playing as she was under 18 years old, and could only stay in the clubs watching the Beatles play until 10 o'clock at night, when the curfew was enforced by a local policeman, and all those under 18 years old had their identification checked and were removed from the clubs. She was different from most of the Beatles' girlfriends in Hamburg days, in that she didn't work in the Reaper Barn as a striptease artist or a hooker, and was just a regular young local girl. While she sat watching the band play and they scanned the audience, she cut John Lennon's eye. And night after night, as she sat there watching him, he started to fall for her. As John's bandmate Paul remembers, there were some really nice chicks that we had our eyes on who would have to go home. There was one called Renata who John fell for quite heavily. Due to the fact that John slept till late in the day due to his exhausting late night walk and Renata having to follow the curfew, they could spend little time together. And this coupled with the fact that John had a girlfriend at home that he very much loved called Cynthia, who would come to visit him in Hamburg now and then. The relationship never progressed very far and wasn't pursued at all after the Beatles stopped playing Hamburg gigs and went on to worldwide fame. The slim and very pretty young Bettina worked as a barmaid at the Star Club and was probably the Beatles' most enthusiastic fan when they were over in Germany. Bettina soon discovered how much she and John Lennon had in common, and the two got on like a house on fire. They would often visit the cinema together where John would particularly enjoy Dracula Mewis, starring Christopher Lee. The two became romantically involved, and before long she became pregnant by John, who reportedly demanded she have an abortion. This was an illegal practice at that time in Germany. But Bettina went ahead with the operation, with disastrous consequences. Following the abortion, 
Bettina quickly developed a glandular condition that made her swell dramatically in size, and which would trouble her for the rest of her life. John and Bettina continued to pal around as they had before, and she continued to settle all his bills at the Mambo Shanky bar, where they hung out with a group of black magic devotees who idolized Astrid, regarding her as a witch. Despite John's shoddy treatment of her following the pregnancy, Bettina was sure that he truly cared for her and decided in 1963 that the distance between the two of them should no longer keep them apart. She persuaded King Size Taylor to take her back home to Liverpool with him in the summer of that year to join the Beatles who were now becoming quite a success. When Bettina and Taylor arrived at the hotel in Hondadno where the band were staying, they were informed that the band was rehearsing at the theater so Bettina decided to wait till they returned. As soon as John walked in the hotel and saw her, he decided to pretend he didn't know her, walking straight over the opposite side of the hotel lobby without saying hello and switching on his transistor radio so that he wouldn't hear her calling him. The rest of the band were deeply shocked and didn't know what to say and only Ringo went over to greet Bettina and Taylor and spend a bit of time with them. Bettina had traveled all the way to Britain just to see John and so she immediately traveled the 102,000 miles back home alone, only seeing John again when the band invited her to their hotel on the 24th of June 1966 during the European tour. The raven-haired, blue-eyed Ida Holly, nicknamed Stevie, was a rarity in the 60s in that she was a female DJ. She was discovered by ballroom manager King Buddy and began working at the Majestic Ballroom. She started going around with John Lennon in 1963, after he was already married to Cynthia, but they were quite widely known as a couple throughout Liverpool and didn't seem to make any efforts to keep their relationship secret. It is possible that their relationship was a good way of disproving any of the rumors of John's marriage and child that Beatles manager Brian Epstein was trying to hide. Ida was totally unaware of John's married status when she started dating him and was really a very prim and proper young lady. When John tried to unzip her dress down to the bum at the conclusion of their first date, Ida spun round and slapped him in the face, for daring to consider that she would accept such behavior. Far from being annoyed, John was impressed with her reaction. Ida discovered quickly that the young John Lennon divided women neatly into two categories. He reckoned that the majority of women were, as he called them, slacks and would offer themselves to any bloke the instant a mutual attraction was felt. The rarer kind of girls were those who demanded his respect, the girls who reminded him of his much-loved and proper Aunt Mimi, whom Ida quickly realized was his barrier, his protection, his shield. The moment Ida lashed out at him, she joined the same category as Aunt Mimi and managed to have quite a long relationship with John without ever sleeping with him. The day that Please Please Me topped the charts, the 17-year-old Ida was due to go on a date with John. When she arrived a little late for their meeting at the Walker Art Gallery, John rushed through the revolving doors to meet her yelling, We are number one, we are number one, swinging her round in his arms and taking her over where George was waiting in the car to escort them to Brian Epstein's office for the celebrations. Ida felt that she and John had a good steady relationship until the day her irate father discovered that John was secretly married and informed his daughter that he was going to expose Lennon in the press for his despicable behavior. When Ida comforted John about it was to snarl that marriage was just a piece of paper and then ruefully insist that he had to do it. From that point on, the relationship between them was over. Ida appeared in the TV documentary Beach City and shortly after moved down to London. In 1973, when John and Yoko decided to take separation from each other, Yoko had chosen the ideal companion for John. She was an attractive oriental girl who had been their personal assistant, 23-year-old Mei Peng. She was asked by Yoko to be with John and to help him out and see to it that he gets whatever he wants. John soon decided to leave New York and live with May out in Los Angeles. This period was known as John's Lost Weekend. It was during this time that John was the most musically active since his Beatle days. He was collaborating with all of his friends and socializing much more than he ever did. 
he renewed his relationship with the other Beatles and even invited Ringo to live with them in LA. Some people say that John was a completely different man when he was with May, as opposed to Yoko. He was more relaxed, he was more lovable and personable. John and May were having a great time out in LA. It was also during this time that John saw more of his first son, Julian, than he had for a long, long time. May encouraged John to call and invite Julian to come down and visit. John and May had taken Julian to Disney World for Christmas one year. Julian also appeared on John's Walls and Bridges album. John and May came back to New York and got themselves on an apartment at 434 East 52nd Street. It was here that the infamous John Lennon sighting of the UFO happened. The story is told that John Lennon was standing naked on the terrace while May was in the shower and had noticed the UFO hovering above. Then he started yelling for May and she came running out to find out what was going on. May had seen it also. Things were going rather smoothly for John and May and he was very happy. Eventually Yoko had decided that it was time for John to come back to her at the Dakota. There are so many stories on how this happened. The only real people who will ever know about this is John, Yoko and May. One of the stories was that Yoko had sent Paul back to LA to talk to John about coming back home. This was taken right out of Paul McCartney many years from now. Apparently John wasn't ready to leave May yet. Another story is that it was finally right in the stars and that Yoko told him he could come home now. That story was taken out of Lennon in America, Jeffrey Giuliano. May states that Yoko had told her a few months before, I'm thinking of taking him back. And under the guise of a smoking queue, had John hypnotized and drugged into returning. According to the official story from John and Yoko, they reunited at Elton John's concert on November 28, 1974. But it wasn't until February 1975 that John actually did return home. Eventually John had told May that he had to go home to Yoko. But John and May continued to see each other and were in contact for the last time in June 1980. Smoke. I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the group and ourselves. I hope we pass the audition. 